and we're live, everyone. Okay, great. Uh, welcome everyone to our Shaping Wealth uh, Town Hall about growth scenarios. My name is Susan Hall and I'm with Lura Consulting and I'll be your moderator this evening. I just wanted to say thank you for joining us on this um, April evening. You can go to the next one, Natalie. Thank you. Uh, so for those of you who are joining by computer or tablet, uh, you should be seeing that your camera is off and are muted. We will have an opportunity to ask panelists some questions. Uh, we'll have a couple of spots throughout the presentation tonight, and you're welcome to use the Q&A button on your screen, or you can raise your hand uh, and use that feature to, to ask a question. And we'll have some spots in the presentation to do that. So before we formally begin, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. As we gather, we are reminded that Guelph is situated on treaty land that is steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people today. As a city, we have a responsibility for the stewardship of the land on which we live and work. Today, we acknowledge the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation of the Anishinaabe people on whose traditional territory we are meeting. So again, welcome everyone. Uh, tonight's town hall is focused on both Guelph's growth scenarios. Uh, we're going to be sharing some information with you about the provincial policy requirements for the city and for the Shaping Guelph project. Uh, we will be providing an overview of proposed growth scenario evaluation framework and getting your questions on, on that evaluation framework, and then talking through some growth scenarios and a proposed urban structure. Uh, again, able to answer some questions. The city team will be able to answer some questions if you have any on the growth scenarios and that proposed urban structure uh, with a wrap up and next steps, um, aiming to be finished around 8.30. So I'd like, before we begin, I'd like to, uh, do a quick round of introductions. I'll just ask the team to sort of wave and say hello. So from the from the city side, we have uh, Krista Walke, who's the general manager planning and build, building services and chief planner at the city. Hello everyone. And we have Melissa Aldenate, who's the manager policy planning and urban design. Good evening. And Natalie Goss, who is the senior policy planner. Hi, everybody. And you'll be hearing from Natalie shortly. And Jason Downham, who's a planner with the city. Good evening, everyone. And Andrew Sander, also with the city. Good evening. And we have Patty Kennedy from Dillon Consulting. Hello, good evening. And Jamie Cook from Watson and Associates. Good evening, everyone. So you'll be hearing from Patty and Jamie shortly. Again, my name is Susan and I'm with Lura and uh, we're working on the community engagement aspects and I'm here with my colleagues, James Knott. Hi everyone. And Stella Zhu. Good evening. Okay, great. So with that, I'm going to turn it to Natalie for our overview presentation. Thank you, Susan. Good evening, everyone. I'll start by providing you with a brief overview of land use planning in Ontario. So land use planning in Ontario starts with the province. The Planning Act sets out the laws for the tools that cities can use to plan. Tools like an official plan, zoning bylaws, plans of subdivision and site plans. The provincial policy statement is a provincial level policy that provides high level direction for the entire province on priorities and things that cities need to consider as they plan. Another provincial plan is the provincial growth plan, which provides a separate set of policies that apply specifically to an area of Ontario called the Greater Golden Horseshoe. And the growth plan sets out a framework for how the Greater Golden Horseshoe will grow over the next 30 years. And then we move into local level or city documents. One of those is a municipal official plan. 
And an official plan establishes a vision for growth and land uses for every property in the city, policies for many items that shape our city, such as urban design, transportation routes, parks, our natural areas, and cultural heritage resources, to name a few things. And underneath an official plan is a zoning bylaw, and a zoning bylaw establishes rules for every property in the city, how it can be used, how tall and wide buildings and lots can be, and how much parking is required. The place to grow, the growth plan was approved by the province in 2019 and subsequently amended in August of 2020. A place to grow establishes forecasts and targets for Guelph to grow for the next 30 years. Guelph is part of the Greater Golden Horseshoe, an area of southwestern Ontario that is expected to grow to 15 million people by 2051. Although most of this growth is still expected to be in the Greater Toronto Area, municipalities in the Outer Ring, the purple on the map, will experience a greater share of this growth over the next 30 years. A place to grow includes a population forecast of 203,000 people and 116,000 jobs in Guelph for 2051. A place to grow requires that we plan for a minimum of half of our new houses that are needed to accommodate our population growth within areas of Guelph that are already developed. And this area is known as the built up area and it's shown in yellow on this slide. We are also required to plan for a minimum density of 150 persons and jobs in our downtown area by 2031 and a minimum density of 50 persons and jobs in our greenfield area by 2051. Our greenfield area is all the lands in the city that are not within the yellow area shown on the map. And it includes lands like the Guelph Innovation District in the east and the Clare Maltby area in the south. We began shaping Guelph early in 2020 with a speaker event. And we heard from Jennifer Keysmat of the Keysmat Group and Pamela Robinson with Ryerson University, as well as Guelph's former chief planner, Todd Salter. And they shared with us Guelph's growth story and things that we should consider as we plan for our growth over the next 30 years. We asked the Guelph community what was important to consider as we grow. And we took that input and drafted a vision and principles to guide our growth for the next 30 years. In August and September of last year, we had conversations with the community about where we should grow and how we should grow, specifically in our built up area. And this was followed by more community conversations in November of last year, exploring different ways that Guelph can grow. Late in 2020 and early in 2021, we released technical studies on our employment lands and on our housing supply. All of these conversations and technical work have led to the conversation that begins tonight. Conversations with you about three possible ways that Guelph can grow called growth scenarios conversations about how we should evaluate these growth scenarios, and conversations about a proposed urban structure. We've accomplished a lot together over the past year. With your input, we have developed a draft vision and principles for Guelph's growth and completed a residential intensification analysis, an employment land strategy, and a housing analysis and strategy. Tonight, we will provide you with an overview of the proposed growth scenario evaluation framework three different ways that we can grow over the next 30 years and a proposed urban structure. Patty will now provide us with an overview of the proposed growth scenario evaluation framework. To the next slide, Natalie. Um, good evening, everyone. So uh, before we get to Jamie's content, which is gonna present the three um, different growth scenarios, thought it would be helpful to walk through our evaluation framework. Evaluation framework is the tool we're going to use to try and tease out the pros, the cons, the nuances, and the similarities amongst the three different scenarios. They're organized into six different themes, and they are informed by uh, the provincial policy statement, the policies and places to grow, which, as Natalie mentioned, are those provincial-level guidance that we have to use when making planning decisions. 
The framework also considers a number of the community's local plans and policies, such as the community plan, the city strategic plan, and the official plan. Ultimately, the framework is organized into six broad buckets or themes, those being complete communities, growth management, economic growth, transportation infrastructure and financing, cultural heritage and natural heritage, public health and safety. The theme of climate change is woven throughout these different themes, and uh, I'm going to walk you through um, kind of at a high level each of these different themes and the criteria associated with them. So the first theme is uh, around complete communities and livability. What we propose to do is evaluate the three scenarios against how well a particular scenario supports multimodal access and connectivity within the city and, and outside the city, how well a particular scenario increases the availability of housing that meets both community and market needs, how well a particular scenario aligns with either particular aspects of the housing forecast and market demand, and also to try and understand how each of these different scenarios will uh, support and help achieve the city's housing, affordable housing targets and objectives. From a climate change perspective and a complete communities perspective, understanding if there are any differences in these scenarios in terms of uh, vulnerability to the built, uh, risks and vulnerability within the built environment and, and whether there's any um, impacts associated with extreme weather and changing climate patterns. Next slide. The second theme is on growth management. Uh, a number of the criteria in this category or theme are intended to tie directly to some of the guidance we have in places to grow. And this is about understanding whether uh, the, there's any particular sensitivities within the scenario around uncertainty related to demographics, market conditions, changes in technology. Uh, what we mean by that is whether a particular scenario is, um, you know, say, offers more opportunity and, and greater flexibility in, in and around people's uh, place of work, for example. Uh, with respect to places to grow, we could try and examine how well a particular scenario supports downtown as a focus of growth or how well growth throughout the built up area or in strategic growth areas is supported by a particular scenario, how well the DGA, um, how well the scenario supports the endorsed and approved secondary plans for the DGA areas, and whether or not a particular scenario is supportive of complete communities and comp out built form within the built up area slide and also within the, the designated greenfield area uh, we also hope to uh, evaluate the scenario so we can understand the differences in the dga whether they're supportive of frequent transit and whether the, the, the dga target rather is supportive of frequent transit service and whether there's opportunities for minimized carbon emissions through a variety of built forms compact growth and intensification and ultimately how well uh, each scenario helps to meet or achieve the draft vision and principles for growth. The third theme is around economic growth and most of the criteria here are relate directly to the city's employment areas and how well a particular scenario provides for the protection of those employment areas and how well they support long-term growth within those areas. Do they provide opportunities to support a range of employment uses within the employment areas and are there opportunities for employment growth in the downtown the uh, next theme is around transportation infrastructure and financing these uh, this, these um, criteria uh, look at ultimately making best use of existing infrastructure and ensuring that there's optimization of infrastructure and that there is um, you know, the, new investments in infrastructure are financially viable over the long term. So the criteria specifically look at how well a scenario uh, maintains and enhances existing community assets and infrastructure, whether there's sufficient capacity to accommodate the existing, whether the scenario um, has sufficient capacity to uh, in the existing and planned infrastructure to accommodate the growth, whether or not the um, scenario maximizes opportunities within the infrastructure and service facilities, and whether we can ensure that the growth is financially viable over the long term. In addition to those, uh, the evaluation criteria under the STEAM also look at whether or not a particular scenario enables opportunities for energy security and resource conservation and promotion of sustainable development, whether or not the scenario 
uh, helps to preserve and enhance a connected green space system and how well it minimizes carbon emissions through an urban structure that supports uh, a modal split focused on sustainable transportation. So in other words, how well a particular scenario supports transit oriented development and active transportation. This next theme is around cultural heritage and natural heritage. And from, for these criteria, we wanna understand whether there's any differences amongst the three scenarios in terms of how well they protect significant natural areas and other elements of the city's uh, heritage, natural heritage system, how well they protect Guelph's groundwater, surface water features, including significant groundwater recharge areas. Do they avoid areas of hazardous lands such as flooding hazards or do they reflect the Fisher Plan policy permissions? Do they support and enhance strong network of connected cultural heritage resources and allow for the conservation of cultural heritage resources and at the same time, do they also balance the need for conservation of cultural heritage resources with the need for growth? The last theme is around public health and safety, and it's trying to understand uh, whether or not the scenario, how well these different scenarios maintain and enhance transportation safety, and to understand if the pattern of growth supports health and well being objectives that mitigate public health risks and avoid natural hazards. Um, so these criteria is a guide. It's a guide that we're gonna hope to sort of help us make a recommendation on a preferred scenario. And I can imagine it's a little abstract with all the, the content we've breezed through quickly, but I think when you get a chance to see the um, growth scenarios, you'll see um, the connection between how we're, how we're proposing to evaluate the scenarios and um, the scenarios themselves. So I will pause here and pass it back to Susan. and We'll take some questions. Great, thanks, Natalie and Patty. So um, we've given a, a bit of a recap of the provincial policy uh, framework, and then Patty's highlighted the evaluation framework that's looking at sort of a series of, of six themes uh, with climate change woven throughout. So just wanted to see if there are any questions that have come in either through uh, this meeting or uh, through the Facebook um, questions as well. We can take any of those. So, James, any questions? Um, either? No questions yet. We do have a couple comments from Facebook that I can share. Um, the okay. first is there is more space in the built up area than being built to only 50% of requirements. Um, and then another is Claire Maltby is the water recharge area for three watersheds. Building there should be intensified in a couple of transit supportive areas and the balance should be green space and water protection area. Those were a couple of comments that came in. Okay, great. Um, for the, those who are attending the meeting tonight, if there are any questions that you have, you're welcome to type them into the Q and a, or you're welcome to raise your hand and we can unmute and take your question. We'll also have some time after we present the growth scenarios and the urban structure. So if there's things that you think of, please feel free to put them in the chat and we can, uh, or in the Q&A and we can circle back to those as well. Okay, I don't see any questions uh, coming through. So we'll just um, keep going from here and I'm going to turn it to Jamie to provide an overview of the growth scenarios. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Susan. So I'm gonna walk through the three growth scenarios that were prepared as part of the city's growth management strategy. And on the next slide, we'll start there with the three scenarios uh, and an overview of those, of those three scenarios. Um, so as part of the uh, growth management strategy and the comprehensive review exercise that the city's undertaking, we've developed three long-term growth scenarios to the year 2051. And as Natalie pointed out previously, each of these scenarios are planned to be consistent with the provincial policy statement of 2020, as well as to conform to the policy requirements of the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, otherwise known as a place to grow. And specifically, each of these scenarios target the minimum requirements for growth allocations, um, which, um, as previously noted, is 203,000 people 
and 117,000 jobs by by 2050. Or yeah, 117,000 jobs by 2051. Uh, as well as requirements for minimum greenfield density and minimum intensification. Uh, as well, each of the growth scenarios also conform with the density requirements and ranges that are proposed, as well as the land uses that are identified in the city's secondary plans for the Guelph Innovation District and the uh, Claire Malpe area. Next slide. So I want to provide a little background on some of the uh, considerations with respect to servicing before we get into the scenarios. The first is uh, with respect to water supply. So as part of the city's official plan review, the city is currently undertaking an update to its water supply master plan. And this uh, master plan will identify solutions uh, to meeting the city's water supply requirements to accommodate population and employment growth to the year 2051. So the initial results of the water supply master plan indicate that by 2051, water demand for the city is forecast to range between about 68,000 to 92,000 cubic meters per day. So that's the overall capacity. And then when we compare that to, to or that's the overall demand, I should say, when we compare that to the capacity of between 65,000 and 83,000, it indicates that the potential capacity ranges are within the minimum demand requirements, but slightly below the peak levels that are identified in the overall demand forecast that I just uh, just summarized. So on the next slide, uh, what's identified is, is through this um, master plan study is that through the GMS, this, the sorry, th through the GMS, the city will be identifying additional water supply capacity uh, solutions uh, that will include uh, water supply alternatives, water uh, water efficiency strategies, existing offline wells uh, with treatment, new test wells, and other new sources inside and outside of the city. During the phase one uh, portion of the master plan um, strategy, a public open house was held in February of this, of this year to gather feedback on the water supply master plan update. And phase two, uh, we'll be exploring additional alternative solutions that I mentioned, uh, and that is now currently underway. Next slide. So with respect to wastewater treatment and biosolids, the city's wastewater treatment and biosolids master plan is also underway. In the fall of 2020, the city held its first open house regarding this master plan update to discuss and gather feedback on this issue. Based on preliminary findings of the water, uh, the wastewater treatment and biosolids master plan update, the city has identified that additional population and employment planned for the city to the year 2051 should not impact the city's ability and capacity to ensure continued uh, effective and efficient water, wastewater service treatment and, and biosolids handling. Uh, it's recognized though that additional uh, people being accommodated within the city to the year 2051 will uh, bring additional costs related to wastewater treatment and technologies to um, address future effluent limits and that as a, as a requirement of that, um, the city's master plan will be looking at additional capital projects as well as an implementation plan to protect the environment, maintain regulatory compliance and enhance current services to be future ready and support the city's growth uh, over the long term. Next slide. So getting into the actual scenarios that were explored, as I mentioned, um, we've explored three overall scenarios. And the ultimate goal of these scenarios is to develop a preferred outcome based on the evaluation criteria that the Patty had just um, outlined uh, a few minutes ago. Ultimately, these scenarios are identified to accommodate growth over the long term in a sustainable manner, uh, reflect anticipated residential and non residential real estate market demand, while at the same time protecting what's valuable to existing residents and new residents and businesses. To achieve this goal, the growth scenarios uh, that have been developed explore a number of variables, including things like directing more housing growth to the city's intensification area within the built up area, adjusting the location and structure, uh, the type of housing within the built up area and the, 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 the DGA or the designated greenfield area, creating new nodes and corridors within the built up area to focus increased residential and mixed use development, adjusting the pace, mix and density of housing growth in the DGA and also exploring alternative uh, density targets within employment areas. Next slide. 
So as part of the growth scenarios uh, exercise, we've um, looked at key inputs uh, that uh, ultimately would be uh, looked at in terms of um, uh, selecting and exploring each of these scenarios. Um, each of these scenarios uh, explored complement and build on the findings of the city's visioning exercise, which was conducted back in 2019 and 20, as Natalie had previously pointed out. And through this visioning exercise, a number of key growth principles were established for the city based on inputs from city residents, businesses, and other stakeholder groups. All of these principles are relevant to the growth scenario evaluation, but there are, there's a few key principles which are important to highlight tonight that directly impact uh, the scenarios that uh, we're going to walk through. Uh, a couple of those key ones are accommodating new people and jobs with, within the city's built boundary through greater intensification, particularly in the downtown area, as well as other strategic growth areas. Supporting a range and mix of housing options that includes increasing the supply of housing that are that is affordable. Maintaining a sufficient supply of lands for innovative employment uses and to meet projected employment needs. Protecting conservation areas and um, enhancing natural and cultural heritage as well as placemaking through innovative design. So building on these principles, a series of technical reports were prepared in 2020 and in 2021, which examined the city's long-term growth outlook, uh, its housing needs and intensification requirements, employment opportunities, as well as future residential and non-residential land needs. So some of the work that we're speaking to tonight will build on a lot of those technical reports uh, that uh, I just mentioned. So to get into each of the scenarios, uh, this next slide just summarizes each of the scenarios that uh, that were looked at. In total, um, as I mentioned, there's three scenarios that were prepared. Now, it is important to recognize that um, the growth scenarios that were uh, uh, established the, the, uh, in those scenarios, the metrics associated with each of these scenarios do not really change significantly due to the fact that the city's urban boundary is fixed and that the largest remaining greenfield areas with, uh, in the city are already comprehensively planned. We're also required to plan for a minimum amount of people and jobs to 2051 that I previously mentioned as part of the growth plan. So each of the scenarios plan for that minimum requirement. None of the scenarios go over that uh, minimum requirement, uh, however. So scenario one meets the minimum intensification requirement assumption of 50%. Uh, it also meets the minimum requirement of uh, DJ density and actually exceeds that target, uh, achieving an overall average of 66 people and jobs per hectare. And it also utilizes the city's existing urban structure in its uh, overall um, uh, assumptions and, and framework. Scenario two uh, adds more medium density housing and some um, additional low density housing supply opportunities to the city's built up area in response to stakeholder feedback. Uh, received during the consultation process in 2020, earlier on this year and last year, um, and uh, also provides more options to meet market needs for grade related housing, which was a key response that we heard through our consultation process. Scenario three adds even further medium and, and low density housing supply to the city's built up area, which results in an increase in the intensification target under this scenario from 50% to 55%. Next slide. So again, just to recap the first scenario, this scenario meets the minimum intensification assumption of 50% and exceeds the minimum growth plan requirement for DGA density at an average density of 66 people and jobs per hectare. It utilizes the city's existing urban structure and it endorses the preferred structure for the Claire Mulvey secondary plan area. Next slide. So this provides just an overview of the growth scenario in terms of spatially how it's um, um, meets, uh, it looks and how it meets the targets uh, or reflects the targets of the growth plan and the, the city's current uh, official plan targets. So again, uh, this map is showing the built up area in the purple area that Natalie had previously identified. In the uh, cream color, that is the designated greenfield area outside of the built up area. So it's all the remaining lands within the city's uh, corporate boundary that are not identified as being built. And so that built up area was, defi was defined by the growth plan uh, back in 2006 and it remains intact today under the current growth plan. So under this plan, you can see that 
the uh, requirement for intensification is being met at 50%, as I mentioned, and the overall greenfield density target is coming in at 66 people and jobs per hectare. Now, I just want to point out uh, that when we look at greenfield density, this density target is um, looking at the overall target for employment in community areas. So 66 people and jobs per hectare does not include uh, jobs that are what what are what what would be defined as employment area jobs or jobs in industrial areas within the, the city. Uh, those those densities would be lower uh, on average than uh, what's shown here. They're averaging around 40, around 47, targeted to average around 47 uh, jobs per hectare in the employment area. So just wanted to point that out. Uh, next slide. So in terms of the overall housing mix that's achieved through this uh, scenario one, uh, this looks at the incremental amount of housing between 2016 and 2051. And you can see um, that uh, in uh, the pink and the, uh, or, uh, the orange color here, that's the overall amount of low density and medium density housing. So that's the grade related housing component uh, that, I, that I spoke of about uh, just under one third of the projected housing that's being accommodated in the cities in that grade related housing form. 57% uh, of the projected housing from 2016 to 51 is anticipated to be in high density uh, housing. So high density housing is all apartments that uh, are, uh, would be including uh, low rise, medium uh, rise and high rise apartments. And then lastly, we have 11% in the blue, which is uh, the identified amount of uh, housing and accessory apartments or uh, what we would sometimes call secondary suites. And those units are typically going to be accommodated in uh, low density housing and uh, stable residential neighborhoods um, to and to a lesser extent and maybe in some other areas that um, in in medium density zoned areas that can accommodate uh, secondary suites. Next slide. So this next scenario um, in terms of the summary, uh, as I mentioned, accommodates additional medium uh, density housing and uh, a small amount of additional low density housing within the city's built up area. Uh, this is uh, accomplished largely through additional intensification uh, identified through um, the uh, intensification of the city's urban reserve lands in South Guelph, which I'll speak to in a bit more detail as we go forward. This uh, scenario slightly reduces the amount of high density housing within the built up area, primarily within the city's strategic growth areas. Uh, and under the scenario, the overall amount of intensification uh, in terms of the, the, the percentage target remains consistent at 50%. So one of the key objectives of this scenario was to uh, provide um, at least as much intensification uh, within the, uh, the built up area, but allow for a broader mix of housing by, by structure type and really focusing in on that um, missing middle, uh, which is sometimes called in the medium density housing category. So we're looking primarily at um, opportunities in the medium density housing range that are um, grade related, uh, but are uh, affordable, more affordable to, to, um, to first time home buyers and more moderate income households. Next slide. So again, uh, this uh, scenario uh, doesn't provide an overall change in the overall uh, targets uh, between intensification and uh, greenfield density. Um, so there's more, you know, minor adjustments that are being made here, largely, as I said, uh, with uh, respect to the housing mix, but the overall uh, broad uh, targets uh, remain unchanged. Next slide. So when we look at the overall mix of housing uh, incrementally that this uh, scenario is producing over the 2016 to 2051 period, we can see that this scenario shifts um, a little bit more of that mix towards um, low density, and medium density housing. The uh, grade related housing supply in this, uh, or demand, I should say, in this forecast is increasing by about 5%. And the, uh, the high density uh, housing conversely is being reduced um, from about 57% to about 52%. And the amount of um, housing associated with accessory apartments or Secondary suites is remaining the same at 11%. Next slide. So, lastly, this third scenario tests the city's ability to meet a higher intensification target at 55%. Uh, 
Uh, it allows for greater residential residential intensification, but at the same time increases the supply of grade related housing options within the built up area. Uh, I, um, sorry, next slide. So, looking at the overall uh, urban structure and growth by planning policy area, uh, with respect to the overall targets for intensification, as I mentioned, this this scenario increases the overall uh, rate of intensification from 50% to 55%, and the uh, the amount of uh, or the density, I should say, in the the DGA is actually reduced slightly in the scenario from 66 people in jobs per hectare to 64 people in jobs per hectare. Next slide. So, in terms of the specifics of this scenario, uh, there's really um, two key things that were uh, were looked at in uh, arriving at this scenario in terms of the, the growth metrics. One was um, a shift in the overall amount of housing, particularly uh, higher density housing and some medium density housing um, from the Claire Maltby secondary plan area, in uh, shifting that into the built up area. So. In the Claire Malpe secondary plan, there's a range of, of density that's permitted within the within the secondary plan. Uh, the overall um, secondary plan typically uh, in most um, documents will refer to the midpoint of that range in planning for housing and, and employment and population. In this scenario, we took the lower end of that range, which allowed us to take some of that uh, population and housing that's being that's being allocated to Claire Maltby and shift that into the built up area. That had that was done primarily through, as I said, uh, shifting of high density, medium density housing, which is as, as a result reduces the overall density slightly in Claire Maltby under the scenario, but allows for more uh, development opportunities within the built up area. This scenario also uh, looks at a, a more um, fulsome uh, redevelopment plan for the uh, urban reserve lands in South Guelph. Um, again, those lands are located within the built up area, so they contribute to the, the city's long term intensification target and allow that target to be increased to 55%. And so when we look at the overall mix of housing that this scenario is delivering, it's delivering a greater supply of grade related housing at about 41% in total. It's about 9% uh, higher than the scenario one a reduction uh, conversely to the high density uh, forecast uh, by about 9% to 48% uh, of the housing. And then again, the, the secondary suites are staying consistent at about 11%. Next slide. So overall, this uh, provides comparison of the three growth scenarios in terms of their overall DGA uh, density target and residential intensification target in the built up area. As you can see, the overall uh, changes between these scenarios is modest in scenarios one and two. There are no changes to those overall targets and we're showing a modest change in the overall um, uh, built up area intensification um, increasing by 5% and a slight reduction in the DGA density in scenario three. Uh, next slide. So this just provides a, a final comparison of the housing mix, which is one of the key things that, as you can see, is really shifting in the, each of these scenarios and one of the, the key tests that we're trying to um, look at uh, in each in each um, option. You, you can see here uh, a couple of things. One is that um, if you look at the, for just to start, if you look at the, the bars for scenario one, two, and three that are in turquoise, purple, and green, you can see that each of the scenarios progressively identifies a slightly greater amount of low density and medium density housing, or what I've been referring to as greater related housing. And then conversely, a, uh, a moderate reduction in the amount of high density housing being delivered under each scenario. The last thing that's just shown here in orange is the current mix of housing that's uh, provided under the, the city's existing growth management strategy, which is adopted in its current official plan. This is showing the incremental housing from 2006 to 2031. So you can see uh, in the current plan, um, there's a greater share of grade related housing, particularly low density housing that's identified in the plan. A lot of that existing low density housing has already been constructed to 2021. Um, and then going forward, we're projecting a slight shift in the overall um, distribution of housing over that remaining time period in the existing um, OP 
largely from low density housing to medium density housing. And again, that's largely as ref a reflection of the amount of supply that's available within the city's um, existing boundaries, as well as uh, market demand and uh, other factors related to demographics and uh, socioeconomic, socioeconomics, uh, particularly uh, uh, housing affordability. So that concludes the summary of the growth scenarios. I'm gonna turn it back over to, to Natalie. Uh, if, uh, there's no questions at this time um, to talk about the proposed urban structure. Thank you, Jamie. So I'll give a brief overview of a proposed urban structure. An urban structure is one element of the way cities manage growth. An urban structure defines areas of the city which are the focus of growth. And it can also show areas that are protected for employment uses and areas planned for future urban uses. So our designated greenfield areas like the Guelph Innovation District um, and Clare Maltby. As part of shaping Guelph, we have reviewed our existing urban structure, which is in place in our official plan now to, that guides our growth to 2031. And we're recommending some updates to it. The proposed urban structure has considered direction from a place to grow, such as requiring municipalities to focus growth within our already developed areas and specifically in strategic growth areas. We've also considered community and stakeholder conversations that we had throughout 2020. And what we heard through those conversations is that our current model for growth, which is directing growth to nodes and corridors and downtown throughout the city, is working well. And that we should continue to direct growth to strategic areas of the city. The proposed urban structure also considered the technical work completed on residential intensification our housing analysis and our employment analysis. So what exactly are strategic growth areas? A key element of a proposed urban structure includes strategic growth areas and strategic growth areas can include directing a specific amount of growth to key intersections of major roads or along major roads. Strategic growth areas can include areas like Guelph's downtown, our urban growth center, which is also proposed to be our major transit station area, and land along or at the intersections of major roads or other areas of the city with existing or planned frequent transit service. This slide shows our current urban structure, which is based on a series of nodes and corridors located throughout the city. And here's a map that shows what we're proposing as an updated urban structure. The proposed urban structure maintains most of our existing nodes and corridors and recommends that they become strategic growth areas. It adds new strategic growth areas in the Clare Maltby Secondary Plan area and the Guelph Innovation District. And these strategic growth areas proposed in these greenfield areas are consistent with the in progress and approved secondary plans. The proposed urban structure also adds a new strategic growth area along Clare Road East to provide a focus area for growth in the southeast area of the city. It identifies employment areas of the city, including the Hanlon Creek Business Park, the Hanlon Business Park, the Watson Industrial Area, and the Northwest Industrial Area. This proposed urban structure maintains our current downtown and urban growth center boundary and recommends that it also be considered our major transit station area. To learn more about the proposed urban structure and how it was developed, you can read a technical brief that's available on our Have Your Say website and the project page as well. So that was just a very quick brief overview of our proposed urban structure. And I'll turn it back to Susan now for any questions on the material that we've covered so far in the presentation. Okay, great. Thank you, Jamie and Natalie. Um, I'm going to turn it to James. So any questions coming through um, through the chat or through Facebook as well, we're happy to take them from, from either spot. Uh, yeah, we have quite a few from Facebook and a couple 
here in WebEx. So I'll start with Facebook because that's where most of our activity has been. Um, the first question, how is the Doe Line area being thought of given the direction of Guelph, Aramosa Township, Guelph, and the landowners? Go ahead, Natalie. Thank you, Susan. So the Doe Line property lands aren't within the city's boundary. They're largely right now in the Guelph Aramosa Township. So this property isn't currently included in our official plan and isn't considered in any of the growth scenarios. Because this is still a proposal under consideration, how the land would fit in to Guelph's plans for growth hasn't been determined yet and it can't be considered as we make plans for Guelph until and unless the land is moved into our boundary. Okay. Thanks, Natalie. Um, next one, James. Um, yeah, this one's kind of a multi-part question. The questions are related. Um, so just bear with me, please. Which option gives us the greatest amount of parks and green spaces? And the, the individual goes on further to ask, is that the trade-off for having more high density housing? We get more green space. Otherwise, why have more high density? Okay, great, great question. Thanks, um, James. So I'll pass it over to the to the team. I was waiting for Jamie to jump in there first, but <laughs> um, I can I can start off. Um, so all of the options give us opportunities for. Um, for parks and open space, all of the options um, protect and enhance our natural heritage system. What we looked at through each of the growth scenarios is making the most efficient use of land that is identified for, for urban uses. So lands that are for specifically for, for growth. Um, the higher the density of a particular housing unit, the more space there is on the ground for other things to happen. Um, so there is the opportunity that the more units we put in a particular building, that the more opportunity there is for, for landscaping on a particular lot or other other types of uses. Jamie or Patty can add to that. That's a good answer, Natalie. I'll I'll just add that uh, the other benefit of the high density forms of housing is they are typically provide a bit of the backbone for uh, your transit network and transit system. So. Theory being the more density we have, the more opportunity we have for transit and the better service we can provide. I'll just add to that. Um, wanted to sort of focus more on the aspect about why we need to have high density housing. Um, from, a, from a market standpoint um, uh, and from a housing uh, delivery standpoint, we wanna make sure that we have provided, a, all the options provide a, a broad range of housing options by structure type. Uh, built form as well as uh, price point. Um, it's important to make sure that we're accommodating all aspects of the, the market. Um, so when we're looking at uh, who's gonna be coming to Guelph in the next 30 years um, and who's going to be looking for homes who currently live in Guelph, we know that there'll be a broad range of, 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 of buyers uh, ranging from you know, first time home buyers and young young single uh, individuals to um, families, uh, growing families with children, and then moving on to empty nesters and seniors. And there's lots of different factors going on here. One of the key factors is that like um, all areas in Ontario and, and brought more broadly across um, Canada, you know, the, the, the population's aging. We're going to see a significant increase in the amount of older seniors. So just focusing on just one aspect, um, which is a key one, that age group is going to require a real range of housing, particularly um, in that older seniors group, there'll be a need for more high density housing options and other options geared to seniors like uh, like seniors housing and um, assisted living and other other um, similar uh, appropriate types of housing for for seniors. So that's a, another key reason why we want to accommodate more high density housing. Obviously, there's a need for a broad range of housing by tenure as well. So when we look at housing, it's not just ownership housing, but it's also rental housing. A large share of the rental housing um, 
supply will come through um, high density forms. So just more uh, facts on the, uh, the high density housing forecast. Okay, great. Thanks all three of you for, for contributing to that one. Um, we had a similar one uh, through the event as well, which was what do all three plans say about provision for parks as we currently have a deficit in most areas of Guelph? So if there's anything to add on sort of parks specifically, Natalie or, or team? So another master plan that we're working on now is our parks and recreation master plan. Um, and they are looking at our supply of parkland and the amount of parkland we will need in the future. So the growth scenarios that are that have been developed and once we move to the selection of a preferred growth scenario will help inform that work. So it's it's kind of a chicken and egg. They the parks and rec master plan needs to know where how much growth we're projecting to accommodate and the location of that growth throughout the city so that they can adequately plan for the amount of parkland that would be needed in specific neighborhoods and, and how much would be needed on a citywide basis. Okay, great. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, James, next ones. Um, a quick question of clarification. Does high density equate to high rises? It just, yeah, to uh, respond to that, it's, um, it's meant to um, reflect a, a range of, of housing in the apartment category from low rise, um, Apartments, uh, you know, 1 to 4 stories to mid rise all the way up to high rise. So it's uh, meant to accommodate a range. Okay, great. Um, we had another 1 uh, here, which is, could you speak to the densities in the Guelph uh, innovation district area? So I think Jamie, you had mentioned, I think it was you in the, in the scenarios. Um, so I think the question is just, what are the densities in those in the Guelph innovation? Yeah, I would have to refer to the, the reports. Um, they're, they're quite high. The, um, the Guelph innovation district is planned to be a, a rather compact, uh, uh community, um, with a, a mix of, um, limited low density and, and medium and, and a significant amount of high density housing. The employment in that area is also projected to be um, higher on average than the overall average density for uh, the, the city as a whole. The overall, as I think I mentioned in the presentation, the overall average density for employment areas is about 47 uh, jobs per, per hectare and the GID is uh, Quite a bit in excess of that. There is uh, plans over the long term that that area would accommodate um, a fairly significant portion of the city's major office demand. Uh, major office employment is employment that's typically defined as freestanding office, uh, uh, twenty thousand square feet or greater. So a fair share of the major office employment is going there as well, which is typically also quite dense. Um, but to get into any more specifics, I'd have to check the the, uh, the secondary plan and get back to you. Susan, I can help out here. Um, the entire greenfield area for the GID is planned to meet a minimum density target of not less than 90 persons in jobs per hectare. Okay, great. Thanks, Jamie and Melissa. Um, we're going to keep going between James and I. I have a few more and I know James has a few more, I think, through Facebook as well. So, James, next one. Um, thank you. How are uh, renewable energy initiatives such as renewable energy 100% um, and climate considerations and initiatives like net zero 2050 being incorporated in the shaping Guelph plans? So, Natalie, I'll start with you and then if there's somebody better to answer that one. Sure, I'll start. Not better, different. different. <laughs> better is fine. Better is fine. Um, <laughs> As Patty mentioned in the evaluation criteria, those are key things that are going to be looked at as we evaluate each of the growth scenarios um, together with 
uh, community and stakeholder input on what should become a preferred growth scenario. As Patty mentioned, there's a number of criteria woven through the evaluation that'll help us understand which growth scenario puts us in a, the best position for climate change um, mitigation and, and adaptation. Um, and looking at our commitments to uh, become a net zero community. Patty, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add to that. No, I think you've covered it. I mean, when we get into this, we haven't done the analysis yet. And certainly um, when we get into it, um, trying to take the differences between the scenarios, which as Jamie explained, are like housing mix and location of growth and density, and then trying to examine the differences from a climate change perspective will be a challenge for sure, uh, but it is something we are committed to doing, and there is going to be trade-offs because it isn't as, as simple as higher density will be more efficient, certainly. Some scenarios that have perhaps taller buildings may not necessarily produce sort of the more energy efficiencies that you would expect if the buildings are tall and full of glass and have a huge energy load, this sort of thing. So there are different um, trade-offs that have to come through that we have to sort of document and analyze when we um, when we do it. And certainly if there are local plans and strategies, we will be able to draw upon those as well. Okay, great. Thank you both. Um, the next one I have is which option would provide future residents with greater housing choices? So I think that's probably to me. Um, so I would say that, um, as I mentioned, each of the scenarios um, have a limited amount of, of, of variability to them based on the fact, that, again, that the city's um, has a limited amount of greenfield area and those areas are largely planned out. But when you look at the overall amount of, of housing by, by structure type, um, so those structure types being typically low density, medium density and high density, forms the scenario three does provide the the greatest range of, of housing across all three it provides um, a, a, a better balance i would say over the long term between grade related uh and in high density uh, the word better may be a subjective uh obviously um then th that um answer really depends on ultimately what how well aligned the the forecast is by type to the anticipated demand, but I would I would say that um, it is a, as we've pointed out, it is a goal to try to make sure that we are trying to provide a, a good mix of housing to meet market requirements. So I would say uh, option three is probably the, the the preferred option from a housing mix standpoint. Okay, thanks, Jamie. Uh, James. Thank you. Um, our next question from Facebook is the downtown height limit open for discussion yet, or are we limited to paving greenfield slash low height infill? Natalie? The downtown secondary plan um, was approved um, over the last decade or so, and we are not looking specifically at evaluating all of the heights within the downtown secondary plan. There are certain areas within the downtown secondary plan that you're currently permitted to exceed the maximum allowed building heights in certain blocks um, through height and density bonusing provisions under the Planning Act. Height and density bonusing um, was removed from the Planning Act, so we're no longer permitted to increase height and density in exchange for community benefits. So we are looking at those specific areas downtown to determine what the maximum building heights should be. Part of the work that we've done on the growth scenarios um, is really looking at what capacity do we have within the approved downtown secondary plan to accommodate growth beyond 2031. And through that work, it has been determined that there is capacity built within the approved downtown secondary plan to accommodate additional growth within the downtown secondary plan, leaving the maximum building heights and the land uses as they are approved. Okay, thanks, Natalie. 
Um, James, I'm going to go, uh, if you have more on scenarios, I have, um, I have some on urban structure, but we'll maybe do scenarios first. Sure, I have a couple um, that touch on the scenarios. Uh, first, uh, what is the anticipated capacity to recoup infrastructure costs for property development under these three scenarios? I can uh, respond to that. Um, so as part of the the growth management strategy and through this uh, scenario evaluation uh, framework, we will be looking at the fiscal impacts associated with each scenario. Um, and then there'll be a detailed fiscal impact that'll be prepared for the preferred scenario. So at this stage, I don't think we can respond any questions uh, specifically on the financial impacts, but just wanted you to know that that is a, a key aspect that will be looked at. Okay, great. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, James, any others on um, scenarios? Um, yeah, one that's somewhat related. Um, where are we with regard to population targets in the built up area now with applications recently approved and currently in the queue? I could uh, take a crack at that. I was going to give uh, Jason a oh, chance to yeah. jump in on that. De definitely. Uh, sure, yeah, I can take a stab at that. Um, so since 2006, um, we have experienced approximately 49% of all of our residential growth within our built up area. And uh, currently our target is only 40%. Okay, great. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Jamie, were you adding anything or are we, are we good? I think, I think we're good. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, James, any others? Um, yeah, I do have more questions I can ask. Um, there's one about the, the water sourcing question. So by sourcing water outside the city, is this a big pipe to Lake Ontario scenario, similar to what happened to, for example, Milton, opening the door to massive future development? So Natalie, through you. Um, so none of us here tonight are the experts on our water supply master plan. So I'll just put that out as a caveat, but my understanding of the work that's happening through that master plan, additional water supply sources would be looking at um, the drilling of potential new water supply sources. So new wells are making more efficient use of ones that have come off stream needed to be remediated and put back, um, put back into service. Okay, thanks, Natalie. Um, I have, I have another one on the built up area. So the comment is the built up area is from two, two, sorry, 2006. Uh, shouldn't you update the urban structure to show what has happened over the last 15 years? So we're planning the current city. So Natalie, I'll start with you. Sure. So the, the built up area, the term, the way it's defined um, was established by the province um, as part of the original growth plan in 2006. Um, and it, it's a term and it's a measurement that, that is trying to be consistent as we move through different growth plans over time. So that we're, when we're comparing how much growth is directed in already developed areas, it's the same measurable over time. As you can see from the growth scenarios, we are planning, and the urban structure, sorry, we are planning for growth throughout the city. Um, it's important to us to plan complete communities um, in every community within the city of Guelph, which is why you're seeing um, the densities that are being proposed in our designated greenfield area specifically the GID and the, and the Claire Maltby area, we are proposing that there be strategic growth areas in new communities, as well as focusing growth within the built up area. The built up area definition and its reference to 2006 isn't just a, a Guelph thing. It's a term that's used across the growth plan. So everyone in the greater Golden Horseshoe, their built up area is measured um, at a line that was drawn in 2006. Okay, thanks Natalie for clarifying. 
Uh, James, do you have any others? I um, yeah, I have one from WebEx. Uh, the okay. former Camtera factory redevelopment at 120 Huron Street seemed an ideal candidate for reduced parking requirements as it offered secure bike parking and its location was ideal for active transportation and transit. Will there be more of this type of redevelopment approved with reduced or even no parking requir requirements in similar locations? Natalie? So the Shaping Guelph project is, is really looking at the capacity we have to accommodate our growth throughout the city. It isn't looking at site specific considerations. So the example of 120 Huron would be an example of a site specific consideration and the parking appropriate with that site. We are um, at the same time doing a comprehensive zoning bylaw review where we are looking at what our parking minimum rates, parking maximum rates, bicycle parking rates, um, and other transportation demand management measures should be in a zoning bylaw going forward. Okay, great. Thanks, Natalie, for the clarification around the site specific. Um, James, any others that have come through? Um, yeah, curious, uh, one person wondering, what is the city doing about the affordability of housing? So, Natalie, I'll, I'll start with you. Sure. So, we do have an affordable housing strategy. And through that, in our official plan, it sets a target of 30% for new residential development to be affordable on an annual basis. Generally, apartments and townhouses provide affordable ownership options in our community, as do accessory apartments providing affordable rental options. Providing a full range and mix of housing opportunities um, increases opportunities for, for affordable housing. Um, we do monitor our affordable housing um, each year, and we did recently um, put out our 2020 growth management and affordable um, affordable housing monitoring report, and that's available on our website um, if you wish to have more information on that. Um, in addition to affordable housing, um, kind of the converse of that is housing affordability. Um, and Shaping Guelph is exploring how and where we should uh, grow to plan our forecast to 2051. We're looking at how much land we need for different types of uses and what our housing mix should or needs to be over the next 30 years. And that's a key component and a key difference between the three growth scenarios. The best way through this um, exercise and through land use planning is to provide a mix and range of housing types to provide um, housing choices in the market for consumers. I'll just add to that that um, so as part of the work that we're doing and that was conducted under the housing strategy is to look at uh, not only looking at the uh, city's ability to accommodate uh, the intensification target or to achieve that target, but also to deliver, as I mentioned, uh, what we feel is an appropriate mix of housing by structure type. And so when we look at um, this, there's a, there's a definitely a, a model that's that's a, adopted when looking at population and housing and household formation uh, from that model then we can look at what the uh, propensity is which is just another really uh, fancy way of saying demand of housing by by structure type and that that propensity is is measured through as a, as a first step through looking at the age structure of the population so as we know as i mentioned as the population ages we're going to see changes in the need of housing by type we're going to see more demand for uh, higher density forms of housing and, and affordable forms of housing. And we know that as housing prices uh, continue to increase, um, if those price increases are higher than income uh, over time, that's going to put further downward pressure on affordability. And we know that um, there has been downward pressure um, in Guelph and over the broader market area. So those are those are factors as well that are being looked at when trying to determine the, the optimal mix. Just the last thing I'd want to say is that when we look at affordability, uh, it's not as simple as just um, 
uh, assuming that more high density housing is necessarily going to be the answer to housing affordability. In some cases, um, you'll find that certain medium density housing types, particularly those more um, entry level medium density housing opportunities are going to be more attractive uh, to low and, and moderate income households and ultimately more affordable. And that's a key reason why in each of these scenarios you'll see a key focus was to increase the amount of medium density housing within uh, largely within the built up area. Okay, thank you both. Um, James, any more? I don't have any more in Q&A for me. Um, one more, uh, how will the city be using public feedback? Natalie? Thank you. Community input provided as part of the growth scenario stage of Shaping Guelph will be used to inform the selection of a preferred growth scenario and ultimately an updated growth management strategy for Guelph. Community input that was received throughout Shaping Guelph already has been used to inform an updated vision and principles for growth, the selection of growth scenarios, and the proposed urban structure. So at, at each key milestone, we use the input that we've gathered to inform the next steps. What we're hoping um, you'll provide us through our online survey and your questions and, and any comments you provide um, is to help us um, inform the selection of a preferred growth scenario, and then we can develop a growth management strategy around that around that selected scenario for growth. Okay, great. Thanks, Natalie. Um, as I said, I don't have any. Don't think I have any more that have come through. Uh, James, do you? Uh, no additional questions. No. Okay. Oh, we've got, actually, I do have one. Um, so there, there is a question that's come through. The goalposts through which the options have been developed are quite narrow. Have any other more robust options been considered? So, Jamie, maybe I'll start with you. Sure, thanks, Susan. Uh, it's a good question. Um, we, we did uh, look at a, a range of, of options. Um, but ultimately, we came down, as you as you noted, to a fairly a narrow uh, set of set of goalposts, so to speak. Part of that reason is when we started off through this process, looking at the uh, optimal growth projections uh, for Guelph to fifty one for population employment. Um, the growth plan requires that we project to a minimum of that two hundred and three thousand and one hundred seventeen thousand. Um, so two hundred three thousand uh, people and one hundred seventeen thousand employment target. We can go higher than that, um, but we have to justify why we would go higher. So through um, the work that um, the consultant team did, we identified that uh, we didn't support a higher growth forecast based on anticipated market demand, available supply, and potential long-term servicing constraints to the city uh, with respect to water supply. So, so we have a, uh, a forecast that we've established as a minimum that we can't go below. We haven't gone any higher. So that kind of keeps the overall targets uh, or scenarios uh, limited to those targets. And then again, because um, unlike other areas uh, in the GGH where you have a two-tier planning system in some, in some cases, um, for example, in Halton region or Waterloo, um, there's more options in terms of location, uh, the, the um, the type of growth between uh, cities and, and townships and things like that. There is limited options uh, in that regard with, with Guelph because it's one single tier municipality. So given that issue, the fixed urban boundary and the, um, the, uh, the, um, the, the point that a lot of the uh, uh, Greenfield areas within Claremont and the GID are already planned, um, and those densities and land uses are identified in uh, in the secondary plans. There's really not too much options that can be provided at a broad level. But what can be continued to be looked at is the specific um, location and accommodation of growth within the built-up area. So uh, further um, refinements can be made in terms of where intensification is being targeted within strategic growth areas versus uh, more stable residential neighborhoods. For example, so those are those are things that continue that can continue to be looked at. Great, thanks, Jamie. 
I'll just give it another minute or two if there's any others. I have a question. That come through. OK, great. Thanks, Thank James. Um, someone asks, when is the shaping Guelph staff report being presented for receipt at Council? Natalie. Thank you. Um, our next um, check in with Council will be with a preferred growth scenario and growth management strategy. And at this time, we're anticipating that that would be sometime in the fall. After that, um, that work will inform updates to the official plan. And so there will be um, an official plan amendment prepared that will be taken to a statutory open house and a statutory public meeting. All of this is working towards an end goal of having an amended official plan, um, an amended official plan um, approved um, sometime in June of next year. We also have a council workshop um, prepared for next week to speak specifically with council um, about the three different growth scenarios, the evaluation framework, and the urban structure. And that uh, council workshop, like all council meetings, is live streamed and um, members of the public are more than welcome to, to watch that workshop. Thanks, Natalie. James, any other questions for you? Um, one did just come in on WebEx. Okay. Was there any liaison with the County of Wellington to consider opportunities for expansion and growth options beyond the Guelph boundary? So Natalie, I'll start with you. Sure, we do um, talk often with with the County of Wellington, so our friends there in, in planning. Um, the topic of an urban boundary expansion is not one that has been explored to date. As Jamie mentioned, um, the growth plan does require us to look at the land that we have and do we have the capacity, the ability to accommodate the growth that we're projected um, within our current boundary. And through the work that um, Dylan and Watson um, have done to date. It has been confirmed that we have the capacity within our greenfield area and our built up area to accommodate our growth within our current urban boundary. So the option of expanding our urban boundary area or settlement area is not one that has been explored to date. Okay, thanks, Natalie. We'll just give it another minute or two if there's any more questions. These have been great questions tonight. Um, I think it really helps people understand sort of the scenarios that are presented and the evaluation framework. So thanks everyone who's been asking questions both on Facebook and through the WebEx meeting tonight. I don't see any other questions at this time. James, are you, are you good? I have no further questions to, to share either. Okay. Great. So I think with that, I'll invite um, Natalie to just cover off the next steps and uh, closing remarks. Natalie. Thank you, Susan. So we kind of touched on this already, but the input that you provide on the growth scenarios and the proposed evaluation framework and the urban structure will be considered by the project team as we begin work on selecting a preferred growth scenario and then developing a growth management strategy for Guelph. So those are our, our immediate next steps. Um, part, uh, this round of engagement really just launched this evening. We um, have two surveys available on our Have Your Say website where you can answer some questions, um, provide some feedback on each of the growth scenarios that uh, we provided an overview of tonight. Provide us your thoughts on the evaluation criteria and then a second survey that's an interactive map where you can um, pin locations on the urban structure and let us know your thoughts about the proposed strategic growth areas and the proposed employment areas. So those surveys are now live and will be up until May the 7th. 
and we'd appreciate as many comments as we can get through that to help us inform the selection of a preferred growth scenario. Um, throughout the next month, um, the Q&A function on Have Your Say is also open. If you think of questions um, after tonight's session or as you're making your way through the survey or reading all of the technical information that's available, um, please feel free to submit questions to us through that. Um, and we'll, we'll post the responses. We'll also post all of the responses to the questions that were asked this evening um, to the question and answer um, on have your say. Um, so those are our immediate next steps. We do have some stakeholder conversations planned throughout the month of April um, and a council workshop planned for next, for next Wednesday um, evening as well. So I, don't, I can pass it back to Susan for some final thoughts. Great, thanks, Natalie. Um, if you could just put the next slide up, it has the links to have your say. So as Natalie mentioned, it would be great to hear from as many people as possible um, by visiting Have Your Say. If you do have questions, you're welcome to submit them there, or there is the plan 2051 at guelph.ca as well. Um, so I just would like to thank everyone for their time this evening, for those who watched on, on Facebook and those who attended the WebEx, and uh, encourage everyone else to take uh, a little bit of time to fill out those surveys on Have Your Say. Thanks everyone. I hope you have a great evening.